to this uh, Greg Congress session that this year is jointly organized with the International Economic Association. So for the ones who don't know, the International Economic Association is the association of uh, all the economic association uh, from around the world and is the unique international organization that brings together economies from developing and uh, undeveloped uh, countries working across, across a broad range of, uh, of fields. And during the past year, the International Economic Association has achieved great success, uh, holding very successful world congresses and range of round table. And this event today contributes to this uh, success. So I uh, really would like to thank, uh, to thank Guido, who has kindly accepted this uh, invitation. We are really honored that uh, you can be here today uh, giving this pre-Congress session and talking about Easy Europe, an optimal uh, political area. So thanks very much. Uh, the floor is yours. So thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege uh, to be here. And I'm going to talk about, oops, okay. <laughs> I'm going to talk about joint work with uh, Alberto Resina and Francesco Trebbi that uh, was recently published in the, in the Brookings papers on economic activity and we hope to continue working on, on these issues. Uh, so uh, in this paper we ask or try to ask whether uh, it is uh, a good idea to continue with political union uh, in, uh, uh, in European integration or not. And we do so uh, taking the framework that was pioneered by Alberto Lesina and uh, uh, Spolaore in a book and a series of papers. Uh, the idea in this book and in the literature on these issues is that the optimal uh, political area optimizes over a trade-off where the benefits are given by economies of scale in, and scope in the provision of global public goods, and the cost of integration is due to the heterogeneity of uh, preferences uh, between citizens in this uh, area. So a narrow area will be more homogeneous and, uh, uh, and, and so has less cost in uh, integrating. By the way, uh, I welcome questions or, uh, or comments uh, as we go along, as if this was the seminar. Now, in, uh, 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 in the case of Europe, as economists, uh, uh, we are used to thinking that there are big benefits in uh, terms of economies of scale and scope in providing global public goods in Europe. And this view, I don't think, is controversial, but it is fairly widely shared amongst public opinion. So despite uh, the resurgence of nationalist rhetorics in, in Europe, uh, opinion polls recently, 2016, would tell you that uh, respondents think that they are in favor of more decision making at the level of the European Union in several areas such as fighting terrorism, 80% would be in favor of more integration promoting peace and democracy, so this would mean defense and foreign policy, environmental policy, uh, immigration, uh, and uh, um, energy. So these are all areas where I think it's fairly uncontroversial to imagine that uh, we would benefit uh, in terms of public goods uh, uh, provision by integrating if we look at the dimension of uh, uh, economies of scale. Uh, the question that we address so we take this as a motivation. And the, the question that we address in this paper is uh, how large are the costs in terms of heterogeneity of preferences between different uh, European citizens? Uh, and uh, uh, so what we ask is uh, uh, whether we are sufficiently similar in uh, our evaluation of, of policies and uh, uh, is there sufficient mutual trust to function as a political union? Uh, and then we ask whether uh, economic integrations have improved the trade-off over time or not. We, we think that uh, several years of uh, economic integration, labor mobility, sharing similar policy issues have made us uh, more similar and so have uh, improved this, this trade-off and we ask whether this is so or not. So what I want to talk about 
uh, is uh, these topics. First, I want to describe how different are Europeans in terms of, of their deeply held cultural traits that would determine their policy preferences and, and view of the world, comparing citizens of uh, different European countries to the observed heterogeneity within European countries, and also comparing it to the observed heterogeneity between uh, uh, citizens of different US states. Uh, then we turn to the question of whether the heterogeneity has increased or uh, diminished over the last 30 years. Uh, and then we also look at uh, institutional convergence or divergence, uh, because that too is a dimension that may be relevant in the discussion of uh, uh, European integration. And then we close with uh, some more speculative discussion. Uh, so the sample of countries uh, is the uh, EU 15 plus Norway, between 1980 and 2008, I'm not sure why we included Norway, it uh, was a country where data were easily available. Uh, but what is important is that we are uh, excluding here countries from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, the data stop just before the financial crisis. And of course, divergence may have increased to some degree uh, since then. Uh, so, uh, how do we measure heterogeneity? So our approach here is uh, not to think so much about specific policy issues. Do we want similar bankruptcy law or similar unemployment insurance? We think these are contingent and more variable beliefs. But um, to look at uh, more deeply held features of our cultural traits that would shape our view of the world. Uh, and we think this is the right uh, set of issues to measure when we consider uh, political integration because we are really entering into a very open-ended contract, like a marriage uh, would be something that you want to uh, uh, engage in. Uh, are you still hearing me? Yes. Uh, uh, you want to engage in if uh, you share, uh, you're sufficiently similar in deeply held values and traits. So particularly, we take 20 questions from the European value surveys uh, on five set of issues. One issue is religiosity, uh, not religion, but religiosity, so uh, the importance of religion, uh, and then uh, issues like uh, suicide and euthanasia where religion would speak to. Gender equality, namely issues that have to do with the role of women in the family and in the workplace. Uh, issues of sexual morality, abortion, divorce, homosexuality. Uh, questions that have to do with uh, uh, the role of the state. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, questions that ask what is the role of the state in terms of redistribution versus individual responsibility, uh, uh, protection of property right uh, and functioning of market versus state uh, and political ideolo ideology, and then a set of questions on values like what are the qualities that you appreciate in children, obedience, hard work, uh, altruism versus unselfishness, uh, and uh, uh, questions of mutual trust and, and self-determination. So uh, let me emphasize again, these are traits that uh, would go after your deeply held view of the world, uh, and the literature on these, is, these issues has shown them to be fairly persistent, uh, changing, but very slowly over, over time. One criterion in, uh, ask, in selecting these questions was also uh, comparability across uh, over time and across countries, and also comparability with similar questions that were asked uh, in the GSS survey that uh, we use uh, uh, to look at, uh, at the US. So that was uh, somewhat constraining. Now, uh, so we then took from these uh, uh, national surveys 250 individuals per country. The results are actually robust uh, to look at 500 individuals. 
Uh, so we have 250 individuals uh, per country in 16 countries and four waves at about 10 years apart from, from each other. Uh, and a few countries were missing early on, more countries are available at the end. So you can think here of an individual respondent as a vector in this uh, multidimensional space of answers. Uh, and uh, so what we want to study is uh, the, this cultural distance between individuals taken to be as the distance between these two vectors of answers in these uh, multidimensional spaces. So we measure distance between individual i and j by the Gaussian kernel, which is given by this formula. Okay, so it's a standard measure of vector distance. Um, and uh, throughout, we will speak about unconditional distance in culture, which is the distance between these vectors, or conditional, uh, or, or distance in conditional culture. And by that, we mean the distance in the residuals of these vectors after you have controlled for individual observable features such as education, age, gender, and income. Okay, so when I talk about distance of conditional culture, I mean the distance in the residuals of these cultural traits. Uh, and this is the answer to the question of how much heterogeneity there is. Uh, the answer is really very little. So, uh, the, the left-hand side gives you the unconditional distance, uh, and the right-hand side gives you the, con the distance in the residuals. Uh, the dotted, li dotted distribution, so th these questions are all normalized to lie between zero and one, uh, and uh, so the dotted line is the distribution of individual distances between respondents of the same country. The solid line is uh, the distribution of individual distances between two respondents that belong to different countries. Okay? So what is striking about uh, this picture is that the two distributions are almost identical. On average, the distance uh, of citi in between citizens of different countries is about 5% larger than the average distance between respondents that belong to the same country. So if you take two Italian at randoms, they differ almost as much as an Italian and a German taken at random. And that's not necessarily because Italians are very similar to Germans, but because there is a lot of heterogeneity within these countries that perhaps we uh, stereotype to be, to be absent. Uh, now, one concern that you may have which would be correct, is that some of this uh, heterogeneity that we are displaying here could be measurement error. But we think that the numbers are, are so telling that measurement error is not driving uh, this feature. So uh, you can ask this question in a different way. You can uh, uh, ask uh, whether uh, the, how, how large is uh, the variance uh, within countries in these uh, cultural traits compared to the variance between countries. By variance between countries, I mean variance between the means respondents of uh, these countries. And uh, uh, the variance within is uh, about 10 times as large as the variance between. So this means that if for, for this uh, to be driven by measurement error, uh, you would have to think that the variance of measurement error is about nine times the variance uh, uh, of uh, uh, the observed between countries variability, which we think would be implausibly large. Okay, so uh, we don't think that this is due to measurement error, and this picture uh, reinforces this view. So here, we repeat the same exercise uh, for uh, uh, a, a typical, for, for, for uh, an average, for, sorry, for um, in Europe, so putting together all European countries, uh, and uh, Turkey, which obviously differs more in terms of these uh, fundamental cultural traits than these European countries. And you see that this methodology tracks the difference in uh, the distribution here more substantially 
the dotted line being the, the distribution of distances within 30, and uh, the solid line is the distribution of distances uh, between 30, not a, uh, well, in the, the first two pictures are Europe as a whole, and the second two pictures would be uh, Turkey and France. And you see that uh, the distribution of distances uh, uh, between Turkey and France is shifted to the right and displays more evidently than uh, uh, in the previous graph. Now, uh, then we ask uh, whether uh, the distance between two individuals can be explained by observable features of these individuals, like their socioeconomic distance, so the distance in the vector of observables of the individual gender, income, education, uh, or where they live. And you can see uh, that there is a positive relationship. Uh, individuals uh, that are economically more different are uh, also culturally more different, uh, and if individuals that live further apart are also culturally more different. However, if you look at the specific numbers, uh, these are confidence intervals, uh, the coefficients are very, very small. So essentially, the cultural distance between individuals uh, is not explained despite the statistical significance. Uh, the observed heterogeneity would uh, be explained to a very small extent by uh, these two by these two variables now uh, this may come somewhat close to what you what you asked we asked the following question with these data where is the cultural center of europe by cultural center we mean what is the average cultural trait uh, between these uh, uh, individuals so we have a vector of responses and we can compute the average vector, the average of these vectors. And we define that to be the cultural centroid uh, of, uh, of Europe, which uh, essentially is the solution to this, uh, to this uh, uh, equation, okay, of minimizing the distance between vector z and uh, the whole uh, distribution of, uh, uh, of uh, individual vectors. Now, uh, we then can compute for each individual, the distance between uh, himself and this uh, cultural centroid, this hypothetical average U e European. Uh, and because we know where individuals live in terms of uh, NAS2 region, we can then compute uh, the average distance of each region from the center of Europe in terms of culture. Okay, unconditionally or conditionally. Uh, and and uh, this is the plot of these regional distances. Uh, darker areas means regions that are culturally more distant from uh, the average. Uh, and lighter regions are those that are culturally closer. Uh, unfortunately, in this picture, the very, uh, th this, uh, uh, like force uh, is missing. So the, the symbol of, of, uh, that, that is uh, occupying force is, uh, indicates that there is no data. Uh, so don't mistake uh, uh, the, the force and a few other regions there uh, as um, very close, they, there is no data. But um, what appears from this picture is that the cultural center of Europe is Germany. Uh, the, German regions uh, are the economic core and they are also the cultural core of Europe. Uh, they are less distant from the average. Uh, however, the uh, economic periphery is not necessarily the cultural periphery. Uh, if you look at Spain and Portugal, uh, uh, most of their regions would be closer to the center than many regions in France. In fact, France and the UK stands out as culturally being more distinct from the rest of Europe than some of the economic periphery. So this uh, is important in the sense that it suggests that uh, cultural cleavages do not necessarily coincide with economic cleavages. So if uh, 
economically more different reasons, regions were also uh, culturally more dis distant from the core, I guess that would, uh, would be more difficult to sustain in the political union, but this suggests that it is not the case. Uh, we also, so this may speak somewhat to what uh, you asked in terms of economy, not in terms of language, but of this particular cleavage, uh, that these cultural differences are not necessarily correlated with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, economic uh, as measured by per capita GDP. Uh, then we asked whether uh, willingness to pursue more integration is correlated with these cultural distances. So in particular, there is a question in the European value surveys that asks individuals whether they are afraid of more European integration in a subset of uh, dimensions. Uh, and we take the principal component of uh, those answers, and that's the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is how afraid a respondent is of uh, uh, further European integration in a number of uh, dimensions. And then we regress in the space of uh, all individual responses, this fe individual fear of European integration on uh, uh, a number of observable features uh, as well as an indicator of the distance in culture of this respondent from the European average, expecting, as the table is suggesting, that individuals who are culturally more distant from the center of Europe would also be more afraid of European integration. And this uh, appears to be true uh, even when you control for regional fixed effects and, and country fixed effects. However, uh, if you look at uh, the specific numbers, this correlation, again, suggests that uh, cultural distance, although correlated with fear of integration, explains not much of the fears of integration. In particular, uh, if you were to reduce cultural distance from its average value to the minimum value in the sample, you would uh, reduce fear of European integration by only 6% of its average. So uh, although cultural distance matters in terms of willingness to integrate, it doesn't seem to be a very important determinant of this willingness to integrate. Okay. Uh, so summarizing the first uh, question that we asked was how heterogeneous are European citizens in terms of this uh, deeply held cultural trait? And the answer is they are not much heterogeneous when you compare them to uh, within country heterogeneity. Uh, then we look at uh, the US as a benchmark. Uh, here we take for the US the GSS data Unfortunately, the GSS surveys are not representative, unlike the European value surveys. The GSS survey are representative of the US as a whole, not of uh, uh, US states. Uh, so here, we have to combine different states in different ways to get a large enough sample of respondents. We do it in two ways. Either we take the nine largest uh, states, which have at least 60 respondents, or we group states in five macro regions. Uh, this gives us a, a bigger number of respondents for each macro region. Um, and then we look at 15, not 20, but 15 questions. They are subsets of the same five set of issues that are identical in the European value surveys and in the GSS. Uh, and, uh, and then we look at heterogeneity. Uh, and here is, uh, is what comes out. So, the left-hand side, again, is the unconditional distance, and the right-hand side is the distance in the residuals. Uh, the first row gives you the distribution uh, within uh, U.S. states uh, and between U.S. states. You actually only see one distribution because they are identical. So 
the distribution of distance within two respondents in the same state is identical to the distribution of distance between two respondents belonging to different states. Okay, they are essentially the same distribution. There is as much uh, heterogeneity between two Californians as between a Californian and a Texan um, in the US. So uh, that's the first point. Second, we compare the US to Europe, and here the solid line is the US, and the dotted line is Europe, uh, and we look at the, the within state distance. So the solid line gives you the average distance between two Americans that belong to the same state, and the solid, uh, the dotted line gives you the distribution of distances between two Europeans of the same state. And you see that uh, there is more heterogeneity within states in the US than in Europe. Not by much, but there is more heterogeneity within states. Uh, the last row gives you the distribution of distances between respondents belonging to different states in Europe, the dotted line, and in the US. And here you see essentially the same distribution. So if you take two uh, Americans, one in California and one in Texas, they differ as much as two Europeans, one from Italy and one from Germany. There isn't less heterogeneity uh, between states in the US than there is in Europe. In fact, there is more heterogeneity, not much more, but a bit more heterogeneity uh, within US states. So, uh, of course, the US is a well-functioning democracy, and so the question is if they can function well with this degree of uh, heterogeneity in cultural traits, maybe Europe uh, could function uh, equally well. So I'll, I'll turn to that, and that's in fact my next question, namely, do we see cultural convergence? Have these uh, uh, distributions shifted over time in Europe and in the US? We cannot go back 50 years, but we can go back to, ni to, to uh, 1980. So we are comparing four waves, uh, sorry, actually 1980 with 2008 uh, in uh, Europe and in the US. In the US, we could go back further. We have not done it, so we look at the uh, 1980s. So I'll, I'll, exp I'll uh, describe that in a moment. We did not do it, but I imagine it would look similar to this, uh, I, I imagine. Right, so, so, yeah, so we didn't look at that. And also, let me emphasize, when look, these distributions are not distributions between a European and an American. Uh, we, are, we haven't looked at that. We could have, but we didn't do that. Uh, okay, so then let me talk about the movement over time. Uh, and so, uh, let me motivate this question uh, first. Uh, so. Uh, we know that uh, the last uh, 30 or 40 years have been a period of uh, successful economic integration uh, and the convergence in some dimensions. And so the question is whether this was accompanied by uh, convergence or not. Uh, uh, so we document in this paper drawings from existing work, adding a bit to it, the extent to which there was convergence. We know, of course, we don't discuss it so much, that, that um, there was a lot of trade integration. We know that there was a lot of uh, labor mobility, increased the labor mobility over the last 40 years, financial integration, and of course, the single currency. Um, we also show, and I'll come to that, uh, that there has been some convergence in per capita income, particularly in the early part of the sample. Uh, there has been a substantial increase in fluctuations at the business cycle frequency between uh, regions uh, of uh, different European states, uh, meaning that uh, these European states face similar macroeconomic policy challenges. 
Uh, and unlike in the US, and this is important to uh, uh, interpret the, the, the data, uh, there has been no large increase or no increase overall in, in income inequality when you look at Europe as a whole. So there has been some increase in inequality within some of these uh, uh, countries, but because there has also been some economic convergence in per capita income between Portugal and Spain and the rest of Europe, Overall inequality, if you pull together all uh, European citizens, has remained pretty stable throughout this period, unlike in the US, where instead economic inequality has increased. Okay, so uh, uh, just to illustrate this, uh, this is uh, looking at per capita income, the, uh, the, the uh, picture up, uh, the, uh, on the top is a sigma convergence, so it displaying the variance of per capita income across countries. Uh, it decreased uh, uh, sharply until the euro, and then with uh, the birth of the euro, this has uh, convergence has uh, diminished. Uh, and the, the bottom two graphs give you the, the beta convergence. So they give you the growth rate of each country uh, plotted against the initial per capita income in the first half of the sample and then in the second half of the sample. And this confirms the fact that there has been uh, increased convergence in the first half of the sample. So whether you look at beta convergence or sigma convergence, you get a similar picture. Uh, and this is um, overall income inequality measured by the Gini coefficients. Uh, here, the data come from the Luxembourg income study for a subset of these countries for uh, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Uh, and as you see, there's been no increase in the overall uh, income inequality. Uh, and then, I don't have slides that illustrate the picture, but we look at uh, regional uh, output growth as well as employment growth, uh, and uh, we compute a correlation coefficient in uh, regional output growth uh, in the period up to 2000 and in the period after 2000. Um, and uh, uh, the data show that growth, regional growth becomes more correlated for regions that belong to different countries uh, in the second period. And this is um, what you would expect in the Euro area, but it's not only driven by the Euro area and this increased correlation between regional output uh, in regions belonging to different countries also is observed for ins and outs of EMU. Uh, so it's, uh, we are exposed to more similar global shocks or technological shocks and more correlated economic policies. Uh, and this is also confirmed by cluster analysis. So there are fewer cluster of regions that could move together. So there is more synchronization of business cycles across countries. So the policy challenges that we face are, have become more similar. Now, the question that interests us, uh, does this integration and economic convergence, did it, was it accompanied by cultural convergence or not in Europe and in the US? And a priori, I think one could uh, entertain different answers. Uh, I could entertain, we expected a positive answer to tell you the truth. Uh, because we thought that uh, the economic interactions that increased, the increased mobility and the fact that uh, the media focus on more similar policy challenges would make us more similar. However, you can also argue that integration and trade has led countries to specialize in different sectors and, and this specialization has made us more different and also in the background, of course, there is internet. And internet, again, may have ambiguous uh, effects because it, um, on the one hand, uh, it provides more information that we all share, uh, so we would all have access to the same information. On the other hand, we understand that the costs of attention are high and we may sort out different bits of information and so selection of different bits of information may make us uh, more different. So a priori, the answer is uncertain. Uh, and so what we do is uh, we look 
at uh, the distribution of individual distances, unconditional on the left hand side and conditional, uh, in the first wave of 1980 and in uh, the last wave of uh, about 2008 uh, in the sample. And uh, the first row uh, looks at uh, the distribution of individuals uh, belonging to different countries, so distances between individuals belonging to different countries. Uh, the dotted line is uh, uh, the distribution at the beginning, 1980. The solid line is the distribution at the end, 2008. Uh, and so what this says is that we have become more different in uh, uh, 2008 than we were in uh, 1980, not by a lot, by about 10%. I don't know how you evaluate this, whether a lot or not. Uh, but uh, if anything, we certainly did not become more similar. If anything, we have become more dissimilar. Uh, the bottom uh, part looks at uh, the same question for respondents belonging to the same country. And uh, the picture looks very similar to the above, meaning that even within countries, we have become more heterogeneous. Uh, and uh, by about the same magnitude, by about 10 percentage points. Uh, by the way, and this may come to the question that was asked, uh, these results on convergence, as well as the previous result on heterogeneity, uh, would be very similar for all countries. So if you look at subset of countries, you get uh, very similar messages. They're not driven by uh, specific uh, uh, country outliers. Uh, so uh, I think what, uh, what is not clear to us is what is the mechanism behind uh, this uh, increased divergence. Uh, one could be due to the, so it's not inequality, because inequality has remained stable throughout this period, um, and there has been economic convergence. So it could be specialization, that we have specialized more, both within, uh, uh, count, within parts of countries and across countries, and this uh, specialization associated with globalization has made us more different or it could be driven by uh, other phenomena, in particular the new media environment which pushes us to select uh, uh, different bits of, of news uh, and uh, uh, exposes us to different events. Uh, then we uh, try to investigate whether this lack of convergence is due to specific cultural traits. So for each of the five dimensions that I described uh, before, sexuality, gender role, religiosity, value systems, and role of the state, we extract the first, the first principal component from the overall sample, uh, and uh, then we look at uh, uh, how uh, it evolves over time, and uh, uh, the answer is that uh, this increased dispersion, this divergence, has taken place in all of the cultural dimensions except one. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, how uh, the, the, the data appear uh, for the five dimensions. So here a dot is the average position of a country. Uh, the first observation is 1980 and the last one is 2010. And uh, the solid line is the average, the European average uh, in, uh, in this dimension. So the left-hand side is um, what we call here cultural capital. So uh, these uh, would be the general values, values of your, the qualities of your children and, and generalized traits. Uh, the second is religiosity. The third is uh, uh, sexual morality. Down, down here you have gender equality and role of the state. As you see, the trend is either stable or up. Up means that you become more modern, uh, so uh, more sexually tolerant uh, and more tolerant in gender equality. And role of the state going down means that you become more progressive. Uh, if I'm sorry, no, more, 
uh, more, less in favor, the contrary, less in favor of redistribution if you compare 2008 and, and the rest. But you see from here that the dispersion has increased, meaning that the dots, the single country position, have become further apart uh, uh, in almost all, in all the dimensions except the role of the state where we have become more similar. Um, and here we look at individual countries uh, and uh, uh, in, in this picture, we look in particular at uh, how uh, attitudes towards gender have evolved over time. The solid line is uh, how the European average has moved, and the dotted line is the position of different countries. So Austria would be the first, and then Belgium, and so on. Now, without, I don't know how many of you can look at this, can see this, but what... Uh, this is telling you, if you look at uh, the names of the countries, is that, uh, not surprisingly, Northern Europe is more modern than Southern Europe in these cultural traits. And the divergence that we have observed is because uh, the North has become more modern while the South, which has also become more modern, has done so at a slower pace. So the divergence in the country positions is due to the fact that essentially northern European countries have become more modern and a faster pace than uh, southern European countries. On, and this is true for gender equality, but you can reproduce the same picture for other cultural traits and the same results would emerge. The divergence, that this 10% divergence is due to the fact that uh, the North has become more modern at a faster pace than the South. And this is the answer for the US. Uh, so here we are plotting, uh, again, the distribution of uh, uh, individual distances. The solid line is uh, the distribution of distances in 1980, uh, four citizens uh, belonging to different states, and uh, the, the dotted is 1980 and the solid is 2008, okay? Uh, so the top row is the two distribution of distances uh, between citizens of different member states, and the bottom is the distribution of distances for individuals belonging to the same state. Uh, and here, too, there is evidence of divergence. So uh, people have become more distant culturally within and across states, again, by about five percentage points. The fact that this is common to the US and, uh, and Europe suggests that maybe it's due to technology and the media environment or globalization, but not necessarily to features intrinsic to countries. Uh, um, incidentally, on this issue, uh, there is a more recent paper by Marianne Bertrand and uh, Mirka Menica <laughs> that uh, has used a different methodology, looking at a much broader uh, set of cultural dimensions, including which media you are exposed to and what are your consumption patterns. Uh, and uh, they find uh, essentially a stationary outcome. So no convergence, uh, no divergence uh, either. So uh, uh, this is uh, a robust uh, finding, the fact that there was no convergence, maybe the fact that there is divergence is more specific to these, uh, to these surveys. Uh, okay, so uh, answer to the question, despite economic integration, we have not become more similar. The last question that we address is whether there has been convergence in the functioning of institutions. This too is uh, important uh, uh, in assessing whether Europe is ready for political integration because uh, there is a fear, justified fears of an implementation gap between the uh, more advanced part of Europe and the more backward part of Europe in uh, enforcing tax evasion, regulation, uh, and other dimensions of uh, institutional system. So you can uh, entertain different priors here too. Uh, you would expect more integration because obviously uh, harmonization 
in uh, institutions and their functioning has been a deliberate policy goal in the Lisbon process. You know that uh, they discussed, the policymakers discussed extensively many policy dimensions with the goal of making them closer to the best benchmark uh, in Europe. However, uh, trade integration uh, may have also made us further apart because it may have led us to specialize in different sectors and maybe these different sectors require uh, institutional features that uh, uh, differ to some extent. In particular, the sectors that specialized uh, in innovation require better uh, enforcement of contracts, better functioning of institutions, and perhaps the sectors that are more backwards uh, are less interested in improving the functioning of institutions. And if European countries specialize in different sectors, maybe um, the factors of production lobby for different policies, and this uh, would be reflected in some of these indicators. Well, uh, what, what do we find? We look at uh, four sets of uh, indicators of uh, functioning of institution. The first is uh, an overall indicator of uh, uh, how effective uh, is government action overall. This is uh, mainly survey based, so we combine uh, perceptions on the effectiveness of government uh, as coming out from uh, the World Bank, uh, Bank indicators and ICRG uh, surveys. Uh, the second focuses more on the functioning of legal institutions. This combines both uh, perception-based indicators as well as uh, hard indicators about the time uh, it takes uh, to pass a sentence or the degree of independence of judicial systems. Uh, and here the sources are taken again from the World Bank and the RCRG, but also from other sources like the Heritage Foundation, Freedom House, and the Fraser Institute. Then we look at OECD measures of um, uh, product regulation. Uh, these are hard qualitative measures of uh, product regulation uh, co coded by the OECD. And finally, we look at uh, outcomes in education as it comes out of the PISA scores for math, reading, and science. For each of these four dimensions, we have a number of uh, indicator of the functioning of the institution, and we take, we extract the principal component for each of these four categories, and that's what we study. Okay. Uh, and this is what uh, happens. Um, so here we look at the sigma convergence. Uh, so the, um, we plot the variance by country of these uh, indicators over time. Um, and so for the uh, overall functioning of government, you see that there is a reduction in um, heterogeneity and then an increase in uh, heterogeneity. The variance uh, increases since uh, 2000 onwards. Uh, for the functioning of legal institutions, that's the second uh, panel on, on top right, between 1990 and 2010, there is a uniform increase. So countries have become more dissimilar in terms of this functioning of legal institutions. Um, whereas there has been convergence in uh, regulation, that's not surprising because we harmonize legislation, uh, and this is what the data is speaking. Uh, more surprising is that there is, uh, on the left-hand side bottom uh, picture, there is also convergence, sigma convergence, in the PISA scores, in the educational outcomes. Okay? Now, what's behind uh, uh, these pictures, in particular uh, for the dimensions where countries became more different uh, is, again, the fact that Northern Europe has improved faster than Southern Europe. So here we look at different countries. Uh, the uh, dotted line here is the, uh, 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 is the European average, and the solid line is the country for the quality of legal institutions. And if you can see the picture, it says that Northern European countries have uh, improved relative to the average, whereas uh, 
south northern European, whereas southern European have deteriorated relative to the average. So here too, the divergence has been like in culture is driven by the fact that southern Europe is lagging behind uh, uh, northern Europe. Uh, although on average all countries have improved, but uh, uh, nevertheless there is this divergence. So um, the answer to the last question is that uh, there has been divergence uh, in the functioning of, of some institutions, uh, an improvement in uh, instead educational outcomes uh, 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 and, and convergence. So these are uh, essentially the results. Let me close with uh, a discussion of, uh, of what to make uh, of this. So uh, I started emphasizing this uh, trade-off that the literature has emphasized, namely the trade-off between economies of scale in the provision of public goods and heterogeneity in preferences. And if you look at this trade-off, it has not become more favorable, but it doesn't seem to be so steep as to prevent European political integration. The heterogeneity of preferences in this deeply held cultural trait does not seem to be what is preventing Europe from functioning as a political institution. And uh, so if, if it is not heterogeneous, so I think this is an important academic uh, uh, result. Maybe we should not focus so much on this trade-off. I think that uh, the stumbling block, and this of course is important both scientifically and for practical purposes, is uh, our identification. Uh, for some reasons, that we don't understand as economists so well, we as Italians are willing to support Southern Italy in terms of poverty alleviation. We are much less glad to support uh, uh, Greece or other European countries. And the same, of course, is true of uh, other nationalities. So there is a strong element of uh, national identification that makes us willing to tolerate and accept compromise within our community than between different communities. Not because we differ so much in terms of deeply held cultural traits, but because of some other dimensions. These other dimensions that we call national identification, of course, correlate with language uh, and they correlate with historical traditions, but uh, and they may be also very deep and persistent, but it is uh, this feature, not so much the fact that we expect the state to do different things or we expect women to have different roles in, in the family. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, the, the surveys also contain questions about uh, the evolution of national identities over time. And uh, here the picture is less favorable. Uh, um, this is the answer to the question of how proud are you of your nationality, of your national identity? And on average, 37% of respondents were proud of their national identities. Uh, at the end of the sample, uh, it's 49%. So uh, in almost all countries, there is a variation across countries, but uh, almost in all countries, we have become more nationalistic despite uh, the integration. Remember, this is 2008. If we ask the, the question now with the, uh, uh, the consensus of, of many nationalist parties, probably uh, the results would be, uh, would be stronger. Um, so I think this is uh, the key difference, not heterogeneity, but the sense of national identity between uh, Europe and, and the US. And of course, the US has had uh, 170 years and the civil war to overcome uh, these uh, national identities. Um, notice that, uh, however, despite uh, uh, this nationalistic tendency, respondents also mention uh, that they feel both national and European. So uh, in 2016, so after the crisis, not so far from now, about half of the respondents would say that they feel both national and Europeans uh, against 40% uh, that they respond that they would feel 
uh, only national. And this exhibits no trend. So this, uh, this number varied over time, it fluctuated, uh, but it's not very different now from what it was uh, uh, in, the, in the more distant past. Uh, so the last, uh, uh, so to us, the, the, the scientific lesson that we learned is that maybe as economists, we should not focus so much on heterogeneity as the stumbling block, but think more deeply about uh, national identities and, and what is uh, determined by. Uh, and of course, this has uh, relevant implications, uh, very relevant implications for policymakers. Uh, and so you can ask, how can uh, this nationalism be uh, reduced? Or um, maybe it's not necessarily a bad thing, but how can European national identity can be strengthened? And I would close with uh, uh, two remarks. The first, if you go back to the history of nation building, uh, it's clear that education played a key role and public education played a key role in strengthening the sense of national identity that was absent early on in uh, many of these European countries. So if we want to strengthen European identity, we should pay attention as policymakers to how educational systems are designed, maybe fostering uh, uh, courses that would emphasize common civic tradition, uh, constitutional features of Europe, uh, and of course, uh, uh, increasing mobility of students. Interestingly, if you compare the uh, identities, European identities of Erasmus students uh, with those that have not gone through mobility, uh, they are not very different, even, uh, even in studies that uh, uh, take care of the self-selection. Uh, having gone through Erasmus does not make you a stronger European. Uh, maybe that's my interpretation because uh, university students are already a very global elite that already feels very European. And so my conjecture would be that taking the Erasmus programs uh, to technical schools and, and to uh, lower level schools uh, uh, may, may be important, but that's a conjecture not supported by evidence. So anyway, education is one important dimension uh, to think about. The other dimension uh, in practical terms is to think about how integration is carried out uh, uh, with existing institutions, the intergovernmental method where you delegate your government to bargain uh, and reach collective decisions is not very effective from this perspective because politicians would then want to show their voters that they have brought home a good deal, that they have brought a trophy home. And of course, this uh, uh, would reinforce in the uh, national debate this national identity in opposition to the interests of the remaining European uh, countries. Uh, whereas if you were to make decisions uh, not with an intergovernmental method but through common institutions like the ECB or the Commission or the European Parliament, holding these institutions accountable directly to uh, uh, citizens where possible, this would reinforce European identities probably much more than the intergovernmental method. The last observation and then with this uh, I, I close, uh, we only looked at uh, EU 15 uh, plus Norway. I don't know whether heterogeneity would be bigger if we looked at uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but certainly European political integration requires narrowing down the number of countries that would be ready to step forward with, the, with this uh, important challenge. So let me stop here. <laughs>